I'm uh, Lee Bermejo. I've done um, uh, a lot of Batman and uh, currently working on a vicious circle with Matt Tomlin. I'm Matt Tomlin. I am a screenwriter and sometimes film director and comic book writer. And I've written in comics Batman the Imposter and a vicious circle. I guess it was there was no other choice. It was just what I wanted to do. That's not that's not true. That's not true. I, I went I went to, to film school for a year. I had been um, showing artwork at comic book conventions since I was 15, and um, had kind of was kind of convinced at a certain point that I was never going to get a job. And because I love film, I thought I'll study to become a director of photography. And. That first year of, uh, of university, I met an editor who was working at a small studio in San Diego. And um, through that person, I, I, I got hired and so started working in, uh, in Wildstorm Studios with Jim Lee in 97. I've spent, since my childhood, wanting to work in comic books, but took a detour and started a career in, in film instead, so it's the, the opposite. Um, and after um, having a, a period of time of, of doing some work on the 2022 Batman film, uh, having that association really opened up the doors for me in, in comic books, and so I was, I was able to get an opportunity to go meet at DC Comics and pitch my idea for Batman the Imposter. And simultaneously, around around the same time, I met Lee, and uh, Lee asked me if I'd ever thought about working on a comic book, and I said yes, of course. And I was a, I was a big fan of Lee's work, and so that was that was kind of an exciting dream come true. So so simultaneously, these these two opportunities arose, um, and so Batman the Imposter and A Vicious Circle actually started at just about the same time, uh, and those are the first two books. Sure. Um, the A Vicious Circle is, uh, it, it starts off in, in New Orleans in, in the year 1960, and uh, we, we meet this character named Sean Thacker, who, uh, he's, he's got a wife, he's got a kid, and he, he lives in this kind of dilapidated mansion in, in the bayou, and um, all, all kind of seems normal, a happy American black family in the 1960s going through the civil rights movement, and um, uh, everything kind of seems fine, except that they've got a guy tied up in the basement. And um, as we as we proceed to to follow this character through his day, we see him, you know, making making bets on political events, and see him talking about uh, the the state of the United the 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 the, the state of the United States. And um, uh, we just start leaning into questions, and it becomes clear as we go on that this guy is not from here, and that he is actually a time traveler. And uh, the events of the story kick off, and, and what we learn in this first book is that uh, this character, Sean Thacker, and the, the man tied up in his basement, who's a, a guy named Ferris, um, that, that these two characters um, are both time travelers, and that they come from a far future, and that they have been entangled in a war with each other, and that they have a, uh, they have a specific curse that follows them where any time that either one of them kills another human being, they both will involuntarily time travel to another period. And so we, we kind of drop the reader in the middle of the story because they've been in New Orleans for a long time. Enough, enough, nobody has been killed for 10 years, and so things seem settled, and then uh, events, events kick off, but then restart their journey. Uh, and, and that's kind of the beginning of the book as, we, as we're wondering who the hell are these guys and what the fuck is going on? And uh, that, that's how we started. When, when, when Mattson was talking about the high concept of the book, this idea that you're involuntarily jumping through time, that in, visually you have to figure out a language to be able to do that effectively for the storytelling, but also something you want it to also kind of give the reader an emotional reaction somehow too. And, and it just seemed like clear that a, a cool way to do that would be to change the style because then not only as the, uh, as the reader are you kind of jolted into whatever this new uh, time is, but, but I think that once that 
idea was proffered, it became about finding the most effective way to, to stylistically interpret the time periods that sometimes goes against type, but that also um, enables enabled me to kind of uh, stretch as an artist and, and 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 not bore and not bore the reader with the same style you know th throughout throughout the book so I think that was that was uh, the, the, the nice thing is that it's not just a, a stylistic choice that we made because it would be cool it actually narratively works you know I think that one of the first things is that a movie um, if, it, if it's not a, a, a true, true indie of, of you and your friends and an iPhone, if, it, if it's a movie, it is going to involve, at a minimum, 150 people. And maybe more like 300 or 500. That's a lot of people that your voice has to pass through to get to an end product. In comic books, even at the highest level, it's like seven, maybe five, maybe three. So it's far, far fewer people that, for me as the writer, my voice has to pass through. And in the case of A Vicious Circle, we, we're really, we're very, very lucky. We, we really just get to do what we want to do. And so I speak, the voice then gets passed over to Lee, he speaks, and then it is a, a combination of the two of us. And so when I, when I look at that book, as opposed to any of the movies that I've worked with, the, the books really feel like, wow, this is, this is a, a strong, strong representation of, of my voice and my abilities as a writer, and it's, it's much less filtered. Whereas in a movie, it gets filtered through 150 to 500 people. So I, I think that that's kind of the big, big difference. As far as process, as far as craft, there's a lot of similarity. For me, the story is a beginning and a middle and an end. It's a character and it's a conflict. And that's what every movie needs, it's what every comic book needs, it's what stories need. Um, I think that the, the difference on a craft level is that in a movie you can describe action. And you can describe a flow of action. Specifically with a fight scene you can describe somebody getting uh, kicked and punched and stabbed and hit. And it, and it can be a whole sequence and a description. And in a comic book you have to break down being kicked and stabbed and punched and hit into still images. And uh, when, when Lee and I talk about it and I equate it to movies, um, I really feel like I am co-directing with him and then I'm also um, the writer and the editor of the movie, the, the book. And then meanwhile he is the co-director, the cinematographer, and he's all of the actors. And between the two of us, that's the whole package, but that, that for me is kind of the difference between movies and, and comic books. Um, for me, the, the inspirations on the writing, um, I've talked about this a lot recently, so I, I, I almost want to stop doing it, but it, it, it's such a North Star for me. Um, the Daredevil run that Brian Michael Bendis and Alex Maleev did in the 2000s, um, I, as a kid I found that to be so uh, mind-blowing, changed my relationship to comic books because it still had all the things that a, a, a Marvel comic would have of, of character in a costume and jumping off of buildings and fights and all of this kind of like big superhero-y stuff but it was so emotionally real, it was so emotionally grounded and it, and it felt very very adult and that's the thing that excites me the most when I pick up a comic, if, if it can really make me feel real feelings um, so that, that has kind of become my, my North Star. I don't want things to get too fantastical. I don't want to get too... I, a Vicious Circle has lots of big sci-fi ideas in it. And I never want the reader to be more interested in the sci-fi than they are in the feeling that the character is going through. Um, and so like that, that for me is kind of like the North Star is, are we still on the, the ride emotionally with this character? The, the, honestly, the, the, the inspirations are many and varied on this book because of the style changes and, and where that started out as being, um, I want a chance to, to draw like my heroes, draw like the people that try, you know, the, the, famous, the famous phrase that I, oh, phrase, the, the thing I always talk about is 
and some of the initial conversations, at a certain point I just said, oh, I'll just do Frazetta for this sequence. <laughs> like, like, it was that cavalier, of the attitude that I could just somehow switch on and Frank Frazetta would come out of my, <laughs> my hands. So, but, but, the, but the intention was not that arrogant. It was a lot more kind of pure and fanboy than that. And then the, the reality becomes something different, you know. So the, the, the initial inspirations were a lot of artists and um, uh, a lot of filmmakers because that's always been something that I've been, I mean, the uh, opening sequence of this was me looking at um, uh, mother, you know, Bong Joon-ho's mother. Yeah. Uh, there's, I have this fantastic uh, book of black and white photography of just that movie while he was while he was making that movie, and that became that sequence for me. And then you know, the, each sequence kind of has its own north star, so to speak. But um, yeah, the the, uh, the inspirations are many and varied. Should have just been my answer, and I should have just left it at that. But there you go, word salad. <laughs> Ferris. I have moments where I really love Thacker. I love Ferris because he's more fun to draw. But I, I don't know. I, I, I wobble back and forth because like there's there's these moments where like there's a um, there's a moment in book three with Ferris that uh, I love truly love and kind of like feel for him but then there's like there's a sequence in book two uh it's a double page spread and it's just a shot of um Thacker putting on a tie and it's like this uh, without spoiling too much it's like the sequence of him getting to know his uh his wife and and I was drawing um a wedding photo of the two of them and I just had this moment where it, I was just like I like this guy I, I, I want this guy to win <laughs> you know, like, like I want it all to work out for him you know what I mean yeah. Uh, so yeah flip, flip, flip flops back and forth for <laughs> it's probably gonna be somebody like Stephen King only in that the guy writes so much and just seems to always be going. And I mean, now he's in his mid to late 70s, still like high output, good work, seems to just have all the passion in the world for it still. And I'd love to just kind of, you know, root around in there and just kind of like figure out like, where's the source of the joy? Like, where is it coming from that you've been able to sustain yourself? And because he's a novelist, he's alone while he's doing it. And so just like, Solitary sustainment of passion. Where does that come from? So I have, I have two. Uh, artistically, visually, it would be uh, uh, Darius Kanji, cinematographer, who um, I just love his eye. I just think he's got the greatest eye. I just think he's, you know, he he. he ha I, I I would love to just pick that brain in terms of. Why, why he composes shots the way he composes them, and, and you know, yeah, that would be the visual answer. The writing answer would be um, a little highfalutin, but uh, it's J.D. Salinger, because um, I think when I read um, Perfect Day for Banana Fish, he has this book Nine Stories, and there's also a story in there about a, um, a pulp uh, uh, artist, writer, you know, and, and, and um, I feel like there would be a lot of interesting stuff to talk about because he had this clearly very talented writer at Dialogue, but more so in his life, he, um, he made a decision to be a very pure artist and not publish anymore and not have any interest in, in, in that. And I would love to know how he navigated uh, just personally that headspace of being a creative person 
in a, in a world of where you're creating like a product, you know? And, and how he was able to kind of like spiritually and emotionally just make that decision, which I don't know many people who could do that. I couldn't do it, you know? Like where you just decide to just do art for art's sake. And yeah, you know, it's, it helps when you write Catcher in the Rye and you have royalty checks that can keep you happy for the rest of your life. But I mean, there's a different side to that because 20 years of that, at a certain point, you're gonna start to probably want, hey, I've written all this shit. I wonder what people think about it. Like, I wonder if, if I still have a voice that people are interested in. He just didn't have that. It was just, you know, he sat in his office, from what I understand, and wrote every day, uh, as if nothing had changed. And I would love to know what that spiritual journey is of an artist, you know, to be able to go from, I've written the, quite possibly the greatest American novel of the 21st century, to, you know, I'm not gonna publish it all, I'm gonna, you know, just write for me, 100% for me.